So, Mark chapter 14, let's start reading at verse 1. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. Mark tells us that we're now two days before Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And a couple of things to note here. First of all, Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread are two different holidays. They aren't the same thing. They're two different celebrations. Passover is the celebration that reminded the Hebrew people of their God redeeming them and setting them free from slavery of the land of Egypt. And on Passover day afternoon, the lamb is killed. And that evening, they gather together as families to celebrate Passover. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the week that follows Passover. It's a whole week. And it commemorated their hasty departure from the land of Egypt. In fact, they left the land of Egypt so quickly that the bread they were baking, they didn't have time to put yeast in it. So when they were on their way, they're eating bread that was unleavened. And that's why they celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, the second thing to note in this verse is the phrase, two days before. The Hebrew people counted days differently than the way we count days today. So if I were to say to you, two days from now, I'm going on holidays, you would think I'm going on Tuesday, because we don't count today, we count Monday as day one, and Tuesday is day two, so I'm going on holidays on Tuesday. But the Hebrew people would think I'm going on holidays tomorrow, because they would count today as day one, and Monday as day two. So in Mark's counting of days, today is Wednesday. And tomorrow is going to be the day that the Passover lamb is killed, which is Thursday. And the Last Supper will be eaten that evening, which, again, a little bit of complicating here. For us would be Thursday evening, but for the Hebrew people would be Friday, because their day starts at sundown. And on this Wednesday, we learn from Mark that the religious leaders are still looking, in fact, looking feverishly for a way to get rid of Jesus. They've been trying to get rid of him for a while. But after Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem, just a few days earlier on the Sunday, and after their confrontation with him in the temple on Monday, they've had enough. They want Jesus arrested, and they want him killed. But they're cautious because they fear the people. Now, remember, Passover is that time of celebrating celebrating God's redemption from the land of Egypt. But for many in Jesus' time, Passover had taken on political overtones. The people remembered God's liberating work in the past, but they're wondering, will this be the year that God will liberate us from the bondage of Rome? And this year, the year that Mark is writing about, expectations are even higher, because just a few days ago, Jesus entered Jerusalem acting like a Messiah. They'd never seen anything like that before. And then the next day, he cleared out the temple. And remember what he said after he cleared out the temple? He called himself the son of David. Expectations are high. They're at a feverishly high level. And the religious leaders are rightly nervous. And Mark tells us they want Jesus arrested and they want him killed. And then... Totally unexpectedly, Mark tells us a story. A story that so strongly contrasts what he has just told us that it leaves us startled. Look at verse 3. And while he was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, And she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, Why was this ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing for me. 
for you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. The scene shifts. Now we're in Bethany, and Jesus is at Simon's house sharing a meal with his disciples and some friends. And notice the man's description, Simon the leper. Now, obviously, he's not a leper at this time, or there wouldn't be a lot of people in his house eating a meal with him. So Simon is very likely one of the many lepers that were healed by Jesus. Now, it, it, just a bit of a side note here. A few times this morning, I'm going to jump to the other Gospels because they add information to the story that Mark is telling us. So I'm, I'm just going to jump to them and just bring in a few extra things. Like, for example, John here adds two very helpful pieces of information. First of all, he tells us that this was the house of Lazarus. So it's very likely that Simon is the father of Lazarus and Martha and Mary. And then John tells us, the name of this woman who brought in that flask of ointment. It's Mary, the sister to Martha and to Lazarus. And Mary enters the room with her most valued possession, a small jar of incredibly expensive perfume. In fact, in verse 5, you see that this perfume is valued at 300 denarii. And remember, a denarii is a laborer's day's wages. So 300 days wages. So those of you who know me know I like to play with numbers. So if you're getting $25 an hour, this little flask of ointment has the purchasing power of today's $60,000. Incredibly expensive. Now it was customary in their time that when an honored guest came to your home, you would take one drop of the perfume, put it on the honored guest, and the other one you would put in the room just to kind of freshen things up a bit. And then you'd close the bottle and put it away so you could use it again next time. But that's not what Mary does. In an act of love and devotion and worship, she takes the bottle, literally breaks the top off, and pours the whole bottle on Jesus, on his hair, his body, and on his feet. Now, as soon as that jar is broken, its monetary value is gone. It'll never be used again. To freshen a room. It can't be passed on to the next generation as an heirloom. Mary wanted Jesus to have it all. This was her gift to him as an act of devotion to Jesus. But did you receive the, read the response? And according to John, it's Judas who says, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And others, likely the disciples, joined in and scolded Mary. They thought this was a total waste. Why not sell it and use the money to feed the poor? They were scandalized by the perceived wastefulness of Mary's actions. But think about Mary. She loves Jesus with all her heart. He's her friend. He's her Lord. He's her Savior. In fact, just a few weeks, maybe a month earlier, he brought her brother Lazarus back from the dead. And here she is expressing her love and devotion to Jesus only to be attacked by Jesus' own disciples. She knows them all. They're good friends. They've been in her home many, many times. And she must have been totally stunned by their actions. Their words and their actions stung her like a whip. Her act of love for Jesus is being attacked by some of her closest friends. And she's almost wondering if she made a mistake. And in, in a really small, minuscule way, the disciples have a little bit of a point because the poor do have needs and we are called to help the poor. And through this all, Jesus is just kind of sitting there and he's watching what's happening. And then he says, leave her alone. Why trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing. Jesus looked at Mary's actions and sees not waste, but beauty. He looks at her motive, and he sees her love, her devotion, 
and her worship, and he accepts what she has given to him as a beautiful gift. And then Jesus responds with a comment about helping the poor. He says, yes, you are to help the poor. Do what you can for them. Be generous to the poor. But, Jesus says, make sure your priorities are in order. Helping the poor is one thing that we are to do with our finances. But it's not the only thing. We can give in other ways as acts of love and devotion to Jesus. And then Jesus says of Mary, she has done what she could. In her own way, Mary has given her all. Now, Jesus' words here are very similar to some words that we heard Matt talk about two weeks ago. Remember when he spoke about the widow? And she came and she put in her two tiny coins into the offering box. And when she put those two tiny coins into the offering box, this is what Jesus said. Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put more in than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Jesus commanded one, a widow, for giving something that was valued at around a penny. And he commanded another, Mary, for giving something that was worth 300 days wages. And for both, he says, they have done what they could. Jesus doesn't look at the amount. He looks at the heart. He looks at the motive when we give. Both of these women gave extravagantly, even though the amount that they gave was incredibly different. Both gave their all. And remember those, those men at that time who came and put their bags full of money into the offering box? Jesus kind of mocked them because their giving was such a small percentage of what they had. They had no desire to give sacrificially, to give their all. But the widow gave her all, and Mary gave her all. And Jesus said of both of them, they have done what they could. They have, as an act of love and worship, both given what they could. And I, I love Henry, what Henry Ironside, an old, old preacher, says about this. There can be no higher commendation than this. All cannot do great things for Christ, but it is well if each one does what we can as unto the Lord himself. And then Jesus says, Mary has anointed my body beforehand for burial. Mary had heard Jesus speak of his upcoming death. She understood. She knew what was about to happen. And part of the reason she did what she did was to anoint Jesus' body for burial to do this as a special honor for him before he died. Now, this is, this is nard that's in that little bottle, an expensive perfume. And remember, it's only a few days before Jesus' trial and crucifixion. And I, I was looking up nard online, and, and the websites say that the scent of nard can last for a good number of days. So this scent would have been in Jesus' hair and on his body while he's being mocked, abused, beaten, and even crucified. This beautiful smell of perfume in the midst of the ugliness of a crucifixion. That's one of the things that Mary did for Jesus. And then Jesus again commends Mary by saying that wherever the gospel is preached, people will think of Mary. Why? Because she is evidence of the gospel of Jesus in action. She's a different person because of Jesus. Because of Jesus, she is willing to give her all. She was a person who put Jesus first. She's a beautiful example of someone who has been impacted and changed by the good news about Jesus. And now Mark's going to do it to us again. He again changes suddenly and dramatically from one story to another. Leaves us startled, almost gasping for breath. Look at verse 10. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the tree priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. 
and he sought an opportunity to betray him from an act of love and devotion and sacrifice to an act of treachery and betrayal. Judas, one of the 12, one of those who were the closest to Jesus, chose to go to the religious leaders to betray Jesus. Everyone knew they wanted to arrest Jesus. They had made that public knowledge. It's interesting, Mark doesn't explicitly give us the reason why Judas chose to betray Jesus. But I find it interesting that this story of Judas' betrayal of Jesus immediately follows what Judas thought was a total waste of money. Has Judas finally had enough? Was money so important to him? In fact, John adds a little bit more information about Judas. He tells us that Judas was the treasurer for Jesus and the disciples. So whenever they had money to, to look after, Judas was the one who did it. And he also tells us that Judas was a thief. He would sometimes dip into that money and take it for himself. Judas, Judas was the money guy. And we've all heard the saying, haven't we? Follow the money. The chief priests are ecstatic. This was better than anything they could have ever hoped for. One of Jesus' own disciples coming to them and volunteering to betray Jesus. They told him they'd pay him for his loyalty. And then Judas went on betrayal mode, watching and waiting for the right opportunity to betray Jesus. Now, in the next verses, Mark is going to jump ahead a day. So look at verse 12. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, the disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. So this is now Thursday afternoon. And Jesus just as he had done a few days earlier, sends two of his disciples out on a bit of a covert mission. Just like when he sent two to find a donkey that he could ride when he was entering into Jerusalem. And now again, for the Passover meal, Jesus has been planning ahead. He wants the location of the Passover meal, where they will all celebrate together, to be kept a secret. Because this Passover evening is his last chance to teach his disciples and he doesn't want any outside interruptions, especially any hostile interruptions. Because we know Jesus had many enemies in Jerusalem. And he doesn't want a confrontation on this evening. So he sends two disciples, according to Luke, they're Peter and John, to look for a man carrying a water jar. Now, this is not normal behavior. A very unusual sight because men didn't carry water jars. That was normally done by women. Sorry, ladies, but that's the way it was back then. So Peter and John are to follow this man, and he's going to lead them to a home with a large upper room. And then they're to say to the master of that home, the teacher says. So the owner of this home is a follower of Jesus. He knows Jesus as the teacher. So Peter and John go, and they find this large upper room, and it's furnished and ready for them. The man knew they were coming, and he had the room all set up for them. Even the other ten disciples don't know what Peter and John are doing, including Judas, so that he couldn't betray Jesus at this exact time. This evening was very important to Jesus. He arranged it all ahead of time, keeping it a secret, even from his own disciples. Only the master of the home knew that Jesus would be celebrating Passover in his home that evening. So Peter and John go out and obtain everything they need for the Passover celebration. They set out the unleavened bread. They set out the wine. They prepare the bitter herbs. They make the sauce that was a combination of dried fruit, spices, and wine. Now, something really interesting about this home 
early church tradition taught that this home was the home where Mark lived. The Mark who is the author of our gospel. He and his family lived in that home where the upper room was. So Mark is present at the Last Supper because there's a lot more people in that room than just Jesus and the 12. Passover was a meal for family. So any of the 12 disciples who had family in Jerusalem at that time, those family members would have been with them in the upper room, plus others of Jesus' followers, as well as Mark and his family were all present for the Last Supper. When Peter and John finish their preparation, they go and let Jesus know that everything is ready. And it's now evening. So for us, this would still be Thursday. But for these Jews, it's now Friday because it's after sundown. It's now Passover. Verse 17. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. So together with family and friends, they prepare to celebrate Passover. Remembering and celebrating God releasing them from the bondage that they were experiencing in the land of Egypt and setting them free. Now, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of a Passover meal. There, there's a slide with all of these things on it. They started the meal with foot washing, and Jesus did that in John chapter 13. Then there's hand washing. Then they reclined at the table. Then there's the first common cup of wine. And when they drink this wine, the host would say, I am the Lord, and I will deliver you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Then there was the bitter herbs. Then they poured the second cup of wine. Then they would sing Psalm 113 and 114. Then they would partake of the second cup of wine, and the host would say, I will deliver you from their bondage. Then there was the breaking of bread. Then they would share the meal together, the roasted lamb and everything else that went with the meal. Then there was the third common cup of wine, and at this one the host would say, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And following that was the fourth common cup of wine, where the host would say, I will take you as my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Then they would sing Psalms 115 through 118, and then the meal was done. So as they're gathering in the upper room, they know that all of these things are about to happen. Everyone knows that. They've all been to many Passover celebrations before, and they know exactly what's going to happen. So why should this Passover be any different from the, all the others that they've ever experienced? Hmm, let's keep reading here. Verse 18, And as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him, one after another, is it I? And he said to them, it's one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is, as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Can you just imagine? Everybody in the room is stunned, shocked into silence. Everyone in that room thought they knew everybody else until they heard Jesus say this. And all of a sudden they're going, what is going on here? Jesus delivers that stunning news. One of you, he says, will betray me. Even clarifies by saying it's one of us in this room who is celebrating Passover together. Now remember, Mark has given us the backstory. He's already told us that it's Judas who has schemed with the chief priests to betray Jesus. But no one in that room, other than Jesus and Judas, know the identity of the betrayer. And they're all looking around, wondering, who could do such a thing? Notice they don't doubt the words of Jesus. Instead, according to the ESV, they say, is it I? And I, I really wish the ESV had done this verse a little differently. And let me explain. In the English language, there's different ways to ask questions. You can just ask a question in a neutral way. You could say, was that a red car? Or you could ask a question in a way that implies a negative answer. It wasn't a red car, was it? Or you could ask a question that implies a positive answer. 
It was a red car, wasn't it? And the question here in our text that all of them are asking implies a negative answer. That's the way it's written in the original language. So everyone in the room, including Judas, is saying, it isn't me, is it? Everyone is wondering who else would do such a thing. And Judas is wondering, does Jesus know it's me? And then Jesus clarifies even more. And he says, it's one of the 12. Now everyone in the room, both the 12 and all those other guests, know that it's one of Jesus' closest friends who's going to be the one who betrays him. And in Matthew, we see that when Judas says, is it I, Rabbi? Jesus responds by saying, you have said it. And then Jesus says, it's the one who is dipping bread with me. And according to John, Jesus then dipped the bread and handed it to Judas. And Jesus said to Judas, what you're going to do, do it quickly. And then again, according to John, Judas exits the upper room to betray Jesus. But everyone else thinks that because Judas is the treasurer, he's just going to look after some money stuff. He's doing his treasurer thing. They don't, they don't all get it. And after Judas leaves, in verse 21, Jesus says, For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had never been born. So in this, in this verse, Jesus is saying a number of things. He's saying, I'm going to die. He's saying, my death is to fulfill scripture. And he's saying, woe to the one who betrays me. He says it would have been better if Judas had never been born. Now just think about this. What Judas is doing is fulfilling prophecy. What Judas is doing is part of the divine plan that Jesus must die. Yet Judas is still responsible for his actions, for the choices that he made. He chose to betray Jesus. He chose to scheme with the high priests. He chose to take the 30 pieces of silver as payment. What Judas did was wrong, no matter the circumstances. And I think what's, what's being said to us here is something like this. We're responsible for the choices we make, no matter the circumstances. When we do something wrong, we sin. And sin is sin, no matter the circumstances. And as with Judas, sin leads to consequences. There is forgiveness. We ask God to forgive us, and he does. There is grace. God loves us. But we are responsible for the choices we make. And the Bible teaches that there are consequences when we make wrong choices. Then Mark goes on to tell us about the Passover meal. Verse 22. As they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Now, you remember from that earlier slide all those things that happened at a Passover celebration. Mark doesn't walk us through the whole Passover celebration. He only hits the highlights. So partway through the meal... At the time of the breaking of bread, Jesus took the bread, broke it, and passed it around. So every person in the room got a piece of that bread. And while they were eating the bread, Jesus said, literally, take this my body. There's no word is in the original text. Jesus is changing the meaning of the Passover meal by changing the meaning of the bread. Now, in their culture... Bread was necessary for survival, was necessary for life. Bread was a staple. They always had bread. And one of the things that Jesus is saying is this. As bread is necessary for your physical existence, so I, Jesus, am necessary for your spiritual existence. Without Jesus, we perish. And then there's the word body. And the word that's used here for body doesn't have the sense 
of a physical body, but more the sense of presence, feeling someone's presence in the room. When we eat the bread, we're not, as some teach, eating the actual physical body of Jesus. The bread doesn't become flesh. That's not what the text is teaching. Rather, we're being reminded of Jesus' presence. When we eat the bread, we remember that Jesus is present with us. So there's two things about the bread. The bread is a reminder that Jesus is necessary for life. And the bread is a pledge that the presence of Jesus will always be with us. And then Jesus took the cup. Now, this is the third of those four cups in the, in the Passover celebration. So between the bread and the cup, they've eaten the whole meal. So there's quite a bit of time between the two of them. This is the cup of redemption. Remember, to redeem means to pay a price to set someone free from sin, from bondage, from slavery. Everyone in the upper room knew the meaning of this cup. They knew that it symbolized God redeeming his people. But again, as with the bread, Jesus changes the meaning. He passed the cup around. It's a communal cup, so everybody takes a drink from the same cup. And after it goes around the room, after they all drink, Jesus says, this, my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Again, there's no word is in the sentence. Jesus is introducing a new covenant, a new relationship between God and people and his people. No longer is that relationship dependent on the Old Testament daily sacrifices. Now the covenant between God and his people has its foundation in one sacrifice. This my blood, Jesus says, confirms the covenant. My blood is the sacrifice that will redeem many, that will bring in the new covenant. And the word many here is inclusive. It means all. When we drink the cup, we're reminded, first of all, that Jesus died, that his blood was spilt so we could be redeemed. He paid the price so we could be set free from the bondage of sin. And then it also reminds us of the new relationship that we now have with God. We're part of a new covenant. We can have an intimate relationship with God, which can be ours only because Jesus died, only because his blood was shed for all people. And then Jesus does something else very interesting. After everyone has had the third cup, they're all sitting there waiting because they know what's coming next. After the third cup, you do the fourth cup. And they're expecting that. And then Jesus says, look at verse 25. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. For the third time, Jesus changes the meaning of one of the elements of the Passover meal. Jesus doesn't partake of the fourth cup, nor does he pass it around so that everyone can have a drink from it. And remember the meaning of the fourth cup? I will take you for my people and I will be your God. And this cup reminded the people of God's promise that he will take all his people to be with him. And there's a time coming after the second coming when all the followers of Jesus will be together to celebrate. And we call it the marriage supper of the Lamb. The whole church, every single person who has been a Christian will be gathered together for the first time. We'll be sitting around a huge banquet table and we'll be celebrating as we share that meal together. And then, with all of his followers, Jesus will drink the fourth cup and pass it around for us. And we will all drink that fourth cup together because we will be his people and he will be our God and we will all be together. Isn't that amazing? You know, this passage has given us a lot to think about, hasn't it? But as I looked at this passage, two things really stood out for me. First was the beauty and the importance of the Lord's Supper. It is such a special time for all of us who are followers of Jesus. Never skip the Lord's Supper. It is an incredibly beautiful thing for each one of us. 
The bread is a reminder that Jesus is necessary for life. And the bread is a pledge that the presence of Jesus is always with us. And the cup is a reminder that Jesus paid the price so we could be set free from the bondage of sin. And it's a reminder that because Jesus died, we can enter into a new covenant with God. We have a new relationship with God. And then there's a second thing that really jumps out for me as I've looked through these verses. This passage is about one's heart. Where's your heart? What's going on in your inner being? Remember Judas? He spent three years with Jesus. He saw Jesus do miracles. He saw Jesus heal people. He heard Jesus teaching. He saw lives changed. He saw and heard it all. Yet his heart was hard. He refused to submit to Jesus and become one of his true followers. His heart was full of greed. He even stole from Jesus and the other disciples. He fell into temptation of the enemy and he betrayed Jesus. His whole focus was on himself, on what he could get for himself. He was all about self. And then remember Mary and remember the widow. Their hearts were filled with love and devotion and worship. One literally gave her last penny. The other gave her most valued possession. They weren't thinking about self. Their focus was on their love of God. Their hearts were devoted to God. And they were willing to give sacrificially as an expression of that love and devotion. And both did what they could. So two questions here for us. First, a question that comes out of Judas's heart. What can I do for me, even if it costs others? And then a question from Mary and the widow. What can I do for God, even if it costs me? Judas did everything that he could for himself. He was looking after self. The widow and Mary did what they could for God. Their focus was on God. That's where their heart was. Where's your heart this morning? Is it focusing on self or is it focusing on God? And then look at verse 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. The last thing they did together after the Passover meal was sing Psalm 118. And I, I did some looking around because I wanted to find a song that was close to Psalm 118. And they did find one, and it's called Forever. So we're going to close by singing at least a part of Psalm 118, just like they did after the Passover meal. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word speaks to us. And I pray for each one of us here in this room that we will be changed this morning because of what your word has said to each one of us. Thank you. Amen.